Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and invite the Holy Spirit to teach us. I'd like to ask if you're able to stand. If you could, let's join together. Let's prepare our hearts, our eyes, and our ears to hear, to receive, and to accept and see the Word of God today. So Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here. Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege to come to your house and worship you and draw close to you without fear of persecution. And Lord, we thank you for that blessing. Lord, we ask that, that you would set your hand upon this house. We don't, we don't come to hear from a man, to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come to fulfill tradition. We come to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that it's Jesus that's the senior leader of this church. And it's in the name of Jesus we ask that your Holy Spirit this morning would be our counselor, would be our wisdom and our guidance to show us things, to bring things to our remembrance, Lord, out of your word that we might see it and hear it, accept it as truth, and live it today. And Lord, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with. We don't think of ourselves as higher or better than anybody else here at The Rock, but we do see ourselves as co-laborers, brothers and sisters working together with the various churches all across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we ask that you would bless them as you have blessed us. We ask today that you would bless our Catholic brothers and sisters, Lord, and all the various churches that belong to the different denominations that preach Jesus Christ as a Savior. Lord, we thank you that your hand would be upon all the Calvary chapels in the area. Lord, our local churches like Harvest and the Grove. Lord, bless Sandals in the Way. Lord, I ask that you would set your hand upon Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist, Victory, New Creation, Oak Valley, Abundant Living, all the churches. Too many to name this morning, but Lord, you know who they are, and we thank you that we are brothers and sisters working together for one common cause, the the, the kingdom of God to be built and expanded for your glory. So, Lord, to you be the praise and the glory and the honor. Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless our senior pastor, Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah. We ask that your hand would be on his, on his body for healing. And, Lord, we thank you that it would be a recovery process that's anointed by God. Lord, that your, that your power would overshadow him. And, Lord, we thank you for your grace to be upon him and Pastor Deborah and your comfort from your Holy Spirit to be with them and overshadow them. Thank you for blessing us with such amazing uh, uh, servants of God, Lord, that have changed our lives. Every, and every one of us in this place, Lord. We ask that you would bless them today. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you got your Bibles as you take your seats, go with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse number 1. We're continuing our series, Defining Faith. If you're just joining us or you haven't caught along, I encourage you to go online, uh, get the CDs. You can watch them or listen to them. You can, you can buy a CD if you want, or you can go online with your phone or your computer and download it or just stream it live uh, at the time. And I want to encourage you to do that. We're in a series called Defining Faith here in Hebrews 11th chapter. Defining what faith is, also seeing now how faith defines us. And before we get in any further, I want to just take you to Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things unseen. That in itself is a great definition as to what faith is. Over the past couple of weeks in this series of Defining Faith, We've looked at the series and we've looked at the topics of what faith is, how do we get faith, what do we do with our faith. So let's just take a quick review because honestly, we're talking a lot about faith. But you know the beautiful part about this series is faith is simple. Because if faith was complex, if it was difficult to understand, if it was hard for us to get a hold of, we wouldn't apply it. We wouldn't live it. We wouldn't walk in it. But the beautiful thing is, is faith is simple. So let's let's review quickly as to what we've talked about already in this series of defining faith. The very first week we looked at what faith is. What is faith? Faith is simply what we believe, a, a persuasion or a conviction. Faith is based on the Word of God and it's our belief. It's the substance. It's the evidence of things hoped for. How does faith come? Do we just get it, you know, with the injection? Does God just drop it on our lap? How do we get faith? Faith simply comes as we saw in week number two. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And more importantly, most importantly, accepting it as truth. By hearing God's word and accepting it as truth, we realize that faith is not based on presumption or wishful thinking, but rather on God's word and his will. Last week we talked about what do we do with faith? We can't just have this fairy tale faith that we hold on to when we believe and, and if we just believe everything will, will, will work out for our, our, our good. But rather we've got to do something with our faith. So we learn that faith has got to be let go or released. We have to do something with our faith. Faith without works is dead. How do we let go? Faith is let go or released by what we say 
and by what we do. Our words and our actions are backing our faith or our beliefs. Today we're going to talk into the subject again of looking at faith, defining faith, but even more importantly now, how faith begins to define us. And I want to pick up kind of where we left off last week in looking at the subject of uh, of, of, of releasing our faith. If you remember last week I had an illustration and I'll bring it back again. We talked about faith as much like a seed. You know, I've got this bag of seed. This, this, uh, this plant survived, praise God, because my Daniel fast was over on Monday and meat entered my life again. Therefore, I didn't have to have a salad. It was wonderful. Uh, so here's this, this wonderful illustration. And faith is a lot like our seed. I've got a seed here. It's dark green lettuce. Now, I know that in this bag or in this seed contains dark green lettuce. But if the seed stays in the bag, it will never accomplish anything. I've got to take the seed out of the bag and I've got to put the seed into the ground. Our faith is much like this seed. If we keep our faith to us, hold on to it, just, it's, it's my belief, I believe, then all of a sudden we get this fairy tale idea. We learn that faith by itself does not bring about the change that you and I so desperately and earnestly desire and need to see, but rather that we've got to take our faith out and release it to sow it. And when we sow our faith, all of a sudden, something happens. We see fruit in our lives. But today I want to take it one step further. I want to take it one step further by saying that anything that you and I want to grow in our lives has got to be fed. If you want something to grow, it's got to be fed. Here I've got this dark green lettuce and uh, garden salad mixture. It's, it's a beautiful flourishing plant and it's doing real well. We water it. We've got some fertilizer in that. I was looking at our garden or our little area of where we've got some things planted and, and around the corner there's a spot where the sun never reaches and the sprinklers don't hit and, and I found this. Now, I don't know if they, okay, they got it. This, my wife tells me, used to be a rose bush, but it, it didn't get any sun. We, we forgot to water about it. We actually literally just forgot about it in general. And so now you can see it's got little brown leaves. It's actually pretty crispy. Um, it's dead. Anything we want to grow must be fed. So we've got faith. We understand we've got to release it. We've got to sow it. But if we want our faith to grow, we must feed it. Because you want faith like this, not like this. I'm fairly certain that every person in here today can look at this dismal rose plant and say, I don't want my faith to look like that. Amen. We've got to learn to feed our faith. Today I want to talk to you about our faith must be fed or feeding our faith. F.F. F. Bosworth, who's a prolific teacher and a, a man who had a great healing ministry in the, in the 20th century, has an amazing statement. He says, Christians feed their bodies three hot meals a day, but their spirit one cold snack a week, and then they wonder why their faith is so weak. Think about that for a moment. We feed our bodies three hot meals a day, but our spirit we feed one cold snack a week, and then we wonder why our faith is so weak. In order for us to have faith and, and to have effective faith, to have faith that does something, that faith that has a foundation, faith that carries us through, we've got to feed our faith. And today we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about how we feed our faith, but I want to also talk to you before we get there on why it's so important for us to feed our faith. I remember about two years ago, I saw a picture of myself, and, and I had kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, I had let myself go. I had adopted a new diet. My diet consisted solely of cookies and milk. Now, I was trying to eat healthy, so I went from whole milk to, to fat-free milk. <laughs> but I found myself in a place where I was no longer comfortable. I couldn't fit in any of the clothes. As a matter of fact, I was on my way to a wedding uh, of a wonderful couple here at the church, and I tried on my wedding suit. You know, we, uh, we all, all us pastors, we got a wedding suit. And I tried it on, and I couldn't fit it. So I had to go to Kohl's on the way to the wedding and just buy a suit to marry a couple in. It was kind of like it got to that point. 
And I remember, uh, I remember a member of our family, she was going through one of those uh, diet bet things where a pool where you pay like $50 and everybody's going to lose some weight. And if you, if you lose a certain amount of weight, then you get your money back and, and then you get a little bit of whoever didn't lose the weight, you get some of their money too. So I remember thinking like, okay, this is a motivation for me to kind of go back to where I wanted to be. I was around 215 pounds. And I got into this diet, this diet bet thing or this pool. And I changed my diet. I, I said, okay, I'm not going to eat sweets at night anymore. I'm, I, I'm not going to eat junk food all day long. I drink a lot of soda. and I'm not going to drink my cow. I didn't go on a diet. Diets don't work. Sorry. But I, I, I just decided I'm just going to try to eat smart. So I just decided to do that. And I lost 15 pounds. It was awesome. I loved it. So I went from 215 pounds to 200 pounds. And I thought, man, this is great. But I, I kind of maintained at 200 pounds. I didn't go any further. And I thought, man, I really I told my wife, I really want to get to 190. If I could get to 190, you know, I'm six foot one. If I get to 190, that would be my happy weight. I'd be happy with myself. I'd start singing Pharrell's song. And, and so I started... Uh, one of my buddies called me and says, man, I got a mountain bike. You want to go mountain biking with me? So I said, okay, you know, I used to do that a lot. And so I pumped up the air in my tires of my mountain bike and I went out before work and we would go riding a couple times a week and mountain biking. And because I brought in exercise to the, to the diet, all of a sudden I lost 10 more pounds. So I was at 190. I thought, man, this is awesome. I, I, I would die happy right now. But then I, I kind of started looking at the scale and I was at 190. And then all of a sudden I hit 189. I was like, 180? I was like, man, I want to get to 180 now. How can I do that? And, but, I, but I wasn't losing any weight, even though I was exercising and even though I was eating smart. Well, then we started training for a, a backpacking trip to, 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 to hike to the top of Mount Whitney. And so I started mountain biking, and then I started hiking, and I started walking, and I started being active. And because of that, I lost 15 more pounds, and I got down to 175. And it was like, man, I am like on cloud nine. What I realized, though, is that, and you've probably been there before, too, is if you've ever dieted, or maybe you've gone to the gym and you tried to work out or you tried to build some muscle. You know that there's this thing called a plateau. That after a while, you, you, you're growing, you're growing, or you're shrinking, or you're shrinking, depending on what you're doing. And all of a sudden, everything kind of levels out. And you hit this plateau. And I was at this plateau my diet, and then all of a sudden, exercise helped me hit it. But then all of a sudden, exercise in my diet brought me to another plateau. I had to bring and introduce another thing into my diet. We understand the concept of a plateau. But did you know that in your faith, that there's a plateau as well? Yeah. That you actually have a plateau in the course of your faith or your belief? I want to show it to you and, and, and show you. We've got this, uh, I've got this little uh, illustration. I'm a real visual person, so I like, you know, when I read a book, I like the pictures. <laughs> so I wanted to show you an illustration. So in your faith, you've got this plateau. This plateau is called waiting. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, we talked about releasing my faith. Praise God. Hallelujah. I let it out. I sowed it. Amen. I put it out there. I'm speaking it. I'm lit. And you're waiting. You're like, okay, God, I said it. I'm acting. Where's it at? I'm waiting for that check or I'm waiting for my kids or I'm waiting for my health or whatever it is. My, my job to turn around. The plateau in our faith is the process of waiting on our faith. And so here is just a, this isn't to scale, okay, but this is kind of like the, the vessel of faith, just for illustrative purposes. You found faith. How does faith come? It comes by hearing and accepting as truth. So you came and you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and you accepted it as truth. And all of a sudden, you found faith, salvation. As you came to church, you heard the word of God. You heard, oh man, God has a purpose for my life. God has a reason. God's desire is for me to have life and, and have abundant life and to be prosperous in, in, in what I do and to, and to have health and, and so forth and so on. So as you did, your faith began to form and you began to rise. And then as your faith began to grow, as you grew in your relationship with God, you got yourself to a place when you said, there's something in my life that needs change. There's something in my life that I need to release my faith. I need to put it out there, whether it's my health or my children or my finances or my well-being or, or something that's going on on the inside of me, an issue that I'm dealing with that I need to get beyond. The Bible says that I'm a new creation and I need to be that new creation. You had to get to this point of releasing your faith. Last week we talked about releasing your faith by what you say and by what you do. Now you've released your faith, you've spoken it, and you're acting on it, and now you find yourself in this position of waiting, the plateau. It's in this place, in this position, that will determine the outcome of your life.
Because you have a decision, a choice to be made. Are you going to feed your faith or are you going to abandon your faith? So in this course of waiting, you feed your faith because anything we want to grow, we've got to feed. We don't want to have faith that looks like this rose plant. So we've learned that, okay, we've got to feed our faith. So as this, this term of waiting goes, as we're waiting, we begin to feed our faith and something happens. It begins to grow. It begins to rise. Things begin to happen in our lives. But there's also another option in this plateau. In the season of waiting, as your faith is out there, as you're releasing it, as you're acting on it and speaking on it, you can also choose to doubt or to abandon your faith. And as you begin to doubt or abandon your faith, what happens is you literally begin to lose it. And it begins to crumble. And you walk away. Or you wonder, was God ever real? Did this ever happen? Is this ever going to happen in my life? And so today we've got to talk about, before we can even get into how we feed our faith, which we'll get into, and it's so easy. We need to talk about why it's so important for us to feed our faith. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of James. James in the first chapter. We were there last week in James chapter number 2. This week we'll go to James chapter number 1. One of my favorite verses in the Bible because it's the answer verse, I like to say. If you have a question, what do I do about my business? James chapter 1, verse number 5. What do I do about my children? James chapter 1, verse number 5. What do I do about my finances or my investments? James chapter 1, verse number 5. What do I do about what the Bible says? I don't understand the scripture. James chapter 1, verse number 5. James chapter 1, verse number 5 says that if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. I love that. And it will be given to him. Ask God and you'll get it. Praise God. That's called the answer verse. You need an answer. Ask God. You get it. But verse number six comes along. Kind of throws a, a wrench into the spokes. And it says, uh, verse number six, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Verse number 7 comes on, adds on to it and says, For let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from God. The total opposite end. God wants to give you liberally and without reproach, meaning he's going to pour it on you and not take it back. But he says, if you've got doubt, you're not going to get anything. Why? Verse number 8 says, because he's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Well, I'll just be open and I'll be honest with you about me. That word doubt has haunted me as a Christian. Standing in faith, believing in God. God, your word says, and all of a sudden uncertainty creeps into my mind. How is that going to happen? I don't see the logical outcome. I need this answer and I don't see it happening right now. And I begin to wonder, is this, is this, is this going to happen? Can this happen? Is this possible? Did I hear from God? Is this really what God wants? We get this uncertainty in our mind and, and all of a sudden I think to myself, oh, dang it! I just doubted! Now I'm not going to get anything. I've got to start all over from, from ground zero. And so this word doubt begins to haunt us because you start to wonder, am I even saved? Can, does God even care? Because I, I can't stop these thoughts of uncertainty. Because if you look up doubt to what you and I understand doubt to be, Merriam-Webster's dic dictionary defines doubt as uncertainty. Uncertainty is, do I want a hamburger or do I want... A, a, a ham sandwich. Do I want the fried zucchini or the french fries? Yeah, see, you talk about healthy living, right? <laughs> okay, how about this? Do I want a hamburger or do I want a salad? There you go. All right, now we're all on the same page. Uncertainty. I just don't know what I want. So we think about that. We think, oh, man, I've got this uncertainty. I've got this question in my mind. How is this going to happen? But you see, this word doubt changed over centuries of translation. You know how words throughout generations change? I remember growing up, when I, when I was growing up in, in school, everything that was good was bad. Man, that's bad. That's so bad. That's bad. And my dad would be like, no! Bad is, good is good and bad. No, dad, that's bad. Man, that's bad. So we, we see that over time, words begin to kind of change. So we look at doubt and we think of uncertainty. 
But when you take this word doubt in the original translation, the original King James says waver. He that wavers, or I like how it says wavereth. That's cool. He that wavers will not receive anything from God. We think, okay, what is wavering? Well, wavering kind of means like this, right? Like, oh, I don't know, I'm over here. Do I want a salad? Do I, do I, do I want a hamburger? Is this going to... That's what we think of. But when you go back to the original translation, or the original word here in the Greek language, this word doubt in the Bible is what we would call a Christianese word. Do you know what Christianese is? You're like, no, I don't know Christianese. So let me tell you what Christianese is, okay? Christianese is like this. You go to church and somebody says, okay, Pastor Luke is going to come and he's going to bring forth an amazing word. Like, you don't hear that at the Oscars or the Academy Awards. I'm a, Billy Crystal's, Crystal's going to come and he's going to host and he's going to bring forth an amazing service, right? You don't hear that, right? It's, it's kind of something that's limited to what you hear in church. This word doubt is actually kind of like that. It's, it's a church word. It, it's got the root of the original Greek word, but it's a word that was originally accepted and, and brought into the Christian language. And when we look at this word doubt, we think of a wavering or uncertainty. What, am I here? But doubt originally defined means to withdraw, to fully separate, or to oppose. Think about that for a moment. To withdraw or to fully separate or to oppose. So I use the illustration of uncertainty. Do I want a hamburger or do I want a salad for lunch? To withdraw, to oppose, to separate wholly would not be do I want or do I want. It would say, I had a month of salad. I don't want a salad ever again. I don't ever care to eat a salad. Give me the red meat. Make it medium rare. Throw another one on top and add some cheese. Don't even put green on my hamburger because I don't want it. That's thoroughly opposing. You see what I'm saying? There's a difference between uncertainty and opposition. And so here in James, he's saying those who are withdrawing or, or opposing or separating from the Word of God, the doubt that he's speaking of is not the question of human thought or reflection. The doubt he is questioning is the very Word of God. When you look at the circumstance, when you look at your faith and you say, that can't happen. Now you're saying that the Word of God is no longer true or no longer prevalent and you begin to withdraw to separate. Just like the devil. The very devices of the devil brings us to a place to question God's word. So here we see the New Living Translation actually gets it right. The New Living Translation in James chapter 1 verse number 6 says, but when you ask him of God, speaking of God, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. Why? For a person with divided loyalty. There it is, separation, withdrawal, opposition. A person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of a sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. We've got to learn that when uncertainty settles in our minds, are we going to feed our faith or are we going to starve our faith? Because anything we want to grow must be fed. If we don't feed it, it will end up looking like my dismal rose plant. And what happens is we begin to doubt divided loyalty. We begin to withdraw from the things of God and doubt brings us to a place of abandoned beliefs. Here, where we begin to lose faith. Now, I'm going to make a bold statement to you. You will have more problems in your life with abandoned belief than you will with unbelief. You will have more problems in your life with your abandoned beliefs than you will with unbelief. Uh, there's a guy I know, a Christian man. You know, he was doing well, he had marriage and kids and everything like that, a Christian man, and all of a sudden something happened in his life and he began to doubt, to separate. Things weren't going the way he was hoping, things weren't going the way he was wanting, and, and doubt crept in. And because doubt crept in, he began to withdraw, he began to separate, he began to oppose. His marriage got rocky and eventually fell apart. And because his marriage got rocky and fell apart, then all of a sudden his life began to fall apart. And he found himself at the bottom of a bottle every day trying to find the answer. 
And I know this man. I've talked to this man. I've seen this man. And he says to me, man, I've got to get back. I've got to go back to where it was. I've got to get everything back in line. Why? Because he knew what God wanted for him. He knew what God's plan was. He knows what the Word of God says. He knows where he should be. But somewhere along the line, he abandoned his faith. And now he's got this turmoil on the inside of him. Knowing where he should be because of the word of God, but not being able to get there because of his abandoned faith. Versus somebody in the same exact situation who never believed, never cared, never heard it and accepted it, would not have that type of a turmoil. They would just say, man, my life just stinks and I got to get better. Not understanding where they, what God has desired for them. So you will have more problems in your life from abandoned belief than you will from unbelief in general. This is why it's so crucial for us to feed our faith so that we don't find ourselves abandoning, letting go of our faith. Why? Because you don't need any problems. You've got enough. I don't need any more problems in my life. I've got enough already. I don't need to bring any more on my life because I abandon my belief, which means we've got to feed our faith. Romans in the fourth chapter. I'll put it up on the overhead for you. Romans chapter 4 says that Abraham did not waver, separate, withdraw, oppose at the promise of God. What? Through unbelief, doubt, but strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham fed his faith. God told Abraham, hey, go to a land. I will show you. You got to take a journey. I'll show you along the way. And Abraham had to feed his faith along the way, saying, God said he's going to show me a land. God said he's going to show me a place. God said he's going to take me to a promised land. God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you descendants that outnumber the stars in the sky. And he's got Isaac and he's got Ishmael. And he says, Man, God said I'm going to have a lot of descendants. God said this. God said this. And he fed his faith and did not waver. Even though the Bible tells us that when the angel told Abraham about Sarah having a son, she laughed. She questioned. She said, am I, really, am I to have a child in my old age? And as the angel is telling Abraham, he says to Abraham, Sarah just laughed. And Abraham's like, what are you talking about? Because she was eavesdropping. So they go find Sarah. Sarah, why did you laugh at God saying you're going to have a son? And she denied it because she was afraid, the Bible tells us. Why? Because she was questioning in her mind, can I have, is this possible? I'm old. I'm 90 years old. How am I going to have a baby? She's wondering this and kind of, <laughs> what are you talking about? But yet, they didn't waver. She had uncertainty in her mind, but she didn't oppose. They strengthened their faith by feeding their faith. You think about Thomas the apostle, or the disciple. Thomas says, unless I see the nails in the hands of Jesus and I stick my hand in his size, I, I'm not going to believe. Yet Jesus shows himself to Thomas and he doesn't kick him out of the group for his, his uncertainty. He gives him a, a rebuke and he says, Thomas, man, you didn't believe. But then he says, blessed is everybody who has not seen and has believed. You see, Thomas still saw the answer. There's a difference between uncertainty and separation. That is the doubt. So take a deep breath. But when uncertainty creeps in your mind, because it will come, what will you do with it? Will you feed your faith or will you starve it and abandon it? What causes us to doubt is the question. What brings us to a place of questioning God's word? in our lives. Because doubt brings us to separation. Separation brings us to abandonment, which brings us to problems. So what causes doubt? Well, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, Jesus gives us a little, a little story. He's talking to his disciples. He's preaching. And all of a sudden he says, a farmer goes out to plant some seed. He throws some seed out and some of the seed lands on a road. And as it lands on the road, people step on it and birds eat the seed. So some of the other seed landed on ground that had rocks right underneath the dirt. And because the ground was shallow, the seed came out of the ground really fast, but then it dried out because it had no roots. And he said there was another section of seed that was sown or was planted, and there was weeds in the ground also. And as the seed came up and as the plant came up, the weeds choked out the, the plant, and it didn't bring any fruit. And then there was some good ground that the seed was planted, and it came and it brought a great harvest. The disciples are kind of looking at each other, looking around, and they're like, Jesus, what are you talking about? So he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he explains exactly what he was talking about. Verse number 14, Matthew, the fourth chapter, Jesus says, the sower sows the word. 
The seed that he's talking about is the word of God. The sower sows the word. And he says, verse number 15, he says, And these are the ones that, that by the wayside, when the word is sown, when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Verse number 16, he says, And likewise are the ones who are on stony ground. When they heard the word, immediately they received it with gladness. And verse number 17 continues and says, And they had no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterwards, tribulation and persecution arises for the word's sake, and they immediately stumble. And he goes on in the third example, and he says, These are the ones among thorns. They're the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And then he gives that fourth example. But there are ones sown on good ground who hear the word and accept it. How does faith come? By hearing and accepting it as truth. There it is. Who heard the word, have faith, who accept it. Luke tells us, who with patience bear fruit. Some 30, 60, and 100 fold. What causes us to doubt the word of God? Because remember, this doubt in James is not a, a, a reflective thought, but doubting the word of God. What causes doubt in our lives? Jesus gives us three things. One, deception. The devil comes and robs the word out of our hearts. False teaching. Teachers that tell you things that you don't need to believe and, and, and you, you know, you, you thought this way or, you know, whatever it might be. False teachings that rob the word out of, our, out of our heart, out of our life. What causes doubt, tribulation, and trial? Man, I don't think I can endure anymore. I don't think I can make this anymore. I, I can't endure any longer. I, there's just too hard and we give up and we doubt and separate. What causes doubt? Good times. How many people have we seen come to church in their most desperate need of God only to find God and to see a solution, a resolution in their life, but when things get better, walk away? These are the things that cause doubt, which leads to separation, which leads to the abandonment of faith, which brings us to issues and drama. But Jesus gives us that fourth example. Good ground. Good ground. You want to be good ground. I want to be good ground. How do we be good ground? Well, we've got to hear it, accept it, and nourish it. Think about it like this. In the process of, 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 of a plant growing, what takes longer? Planting, harvesting, or watering? Think about that for a moment. Look at, look at my, my lettuce plant here. It takes me all but 30 seconds to take a seed and stick it in the ground. It takes me all but a, a, a second to rip off a piece of lettuce. But it takes months for this plant to be watered, to get to the place that it is. Watering takes the longest in the process of growth, which means to you and I that the process of feeding our faith should be more frequent than the process of releasing it. Feeding your faith should be more frequent than releasing your faith because you find yourself here in a plateau. So then the question arises, how do I feed my faith? Remember how I said in the beginning, thank God it's easy because if it was hard or difficult to remember, we wouldn't do it. And if we didn't do it, we wouldn't walk by it and therefore it would be impossible to please God and we'd find ourselves doomed. Faith is not hard, praise God. It's easy. How do you feed your faith? So simple. How do you feed your faith? Let's look at how you release your faith. Last week, you release your faith by what you say and by what you do, your actions, right? How do you feed your faith? You feed your faith on what God says and on what God did. You release your faith by what you say and by what you do. You feed your faith on what God says and what God did. It's just that simple. The process of feeding your faith should be more frequent than releasing it. We feed our faith quickly on those two thoughts, on what God says. What formed your faith in the very beginning? That's what you feed your faith. It's there you were at a point in your life, you heard Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You heard it and you accepted it as truth and you find yourself here. 
You've got faith, now you're believing it. Then you go to church, and all of a sudden things are rising. You've, you've heard some scriptures. Man, Jesus said that I've come to give you life and more abundantly. Man, I want, I'm, God wants me to have a good life, and your faith begins to grow. What formed your faith in the beginning? That's what you feed your faith on. The scripture that you have in your life, the word of God that says that you should have life, the word of God that says you should be healed, the word of God that says no weapon formed against you should prosper, the word of God that says as for me and my house, whatever it is that formed your faith, that is what you feed it on. <laughs> Habakkuk, that one, that one book in the Bible that's really hard to produce or pronounce, Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2-2. Write the vision and make it plain so that he who runs may read it. Whatever it is that you formed your faith on or whatever it was that was founded on, write it down. Make it plain. Put it to memory. Put it on your computer screen or on your mirror in the morning. Memorize it. Recite it. Tell yourself over and over and over again what it is that founded your faith. I remember I was really afraid of heights. I knew that God's desire for me was to not be a person that had to crawl on my belly anytime I got above three feet off the ground. And I got into hiking, and I hiked this one section on Mount Baldy over here locally. That's called the Devil's Backbone. And on the Devil's Backbone, there's a 400-foot cliff on one side of the trail and about an 85-degree uh, slope on the other side. And the trail's about three feet wide. You're on the very tip of the mountain. And I remember the very first time I hiked that with some friends, I had to crawl. I had to get on my hands and my knees. And I said, I'm not going to let fear take a hold of me. I came back to that section of the trail. And I fed my faith with what formed my faith. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Every time I took a step, not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I've got power, love, and a sound mind. Fear, that's not from God, but power, love, and a sound mind. And I kept feeding my faith. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and the ground was flat. And I turned around, and I had made it through that section that so scared me in the beginning. Why? Because I fed my faith on what it was formed. I had not been given a spirit of fear. The second thing we feed our faith on, how do we feed our faith on, on, on what God says? Secondly, on what God did, God's faithfulness to you. What has God done in your life? That is what you feed your faith on. Sometimes I'm a, I'm a real glass is half empty kind of guy. I wish, I wish I was a glass is half full person. I wish that I could see the, 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 the challenge or, the, the, negative, or the, 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 the problem in front of me and say, man, there's so much opportunity. But I'm the kind of guy that says, man, we've got problems. And because of that, I beat myself up a lot. Maybe it's just something so simple as like a little hobby and I make a mistake on a project that I'm doing or, or I'm painting a wall and I, and I paint it on the ceiling. I just beat myself up. Man, you're just so lousy. Why are you so dumb? Why are you? I, I beat myself and I get real down. And sometimes Stacy tells me, man, you need to like knock it off. <laughs> but then I look around and I see my kids. I see my wife. I see my house and all the things that God's blessed me with. I see the church. I remember the letters of people that have written me and said, Pastor Luke, you said this and it changed my life. And the testimonies of people that said, you've made a difference in my life. And all of a sudden, I can no longer get down on myself because I'm remembering that God has done something in my life, that there have been victories in my life that I have gotten over because of God. I call it the lions and the bears, not the football team. 1 Samuel chapter 17, David is he's convincing Saul to let him be the sole representative in a grudge match to the death against Philistine's greatest warrior, Goliath. Tell Saul, moreover, moreover, the Lord who rescued me from the mouth of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. He had notches in his belt every time and he went over them and he rehearsed them and he reminded him of, of, of what God has done. Paul the Apostle, same thing, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10, Paul says, God rescued me. God will rescue me. I don't rely on me. I rely on God. Why? Because he will continue to rescue me. I feed my faith on God's faithfulness. Like that old song we used to sing, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, 
how he raised me, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he put my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout. Why? Because when we look at the faithfulness of God, we inject God's love, his faith into our lives, and our faith begins to grow because like Abraham, we were strengthened in faith. Uncertainty will creep in. It's humanity's condition. You can't escape it because of humanity's condition. Uncertainty will creep in, but you have the choice. Are you going to feed your faith with doubt and question, or are you going to feed your faith with what formed it and God's faithfulness? You might say, Pastor Luke, I'm right here. I, I, don't, I don't know what God's done yet. I, I, just, I haven't had those victories. That's okay. You've got the Bible. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation shows that God is faithful to his word. We've got what we call church history from the resurrection of Jesus Christ till today. 2,000 years to prove that God is faithful to his church. There are more people on earth today serving Jesus Christ than ever before. The church is growing, not shrinking. Why? Because God is faithful. So feed your faith on what God has done with others and you'll find yourself victorious in a battle and then you've got something to feed your faith on in your own experience. But start by feeding your faith with what God said, the words that founded it and what God has done, his faithfulness to you. Everything we want to grow has got to be fed. Don't abandon it in doubt, in question, in separation. Don't let the devil rob it from your heart. Don't let trials and tribulations take it away from you. Don't let the good times and, and the times of complacency stop you from feeding your faith with what founded it and with God's faithfulness. And as you do, you will see a harvest in your life. You won't look like this anymore. You will look like this. Did you guys get something out of the Word of God today? I want to ask you a question. It's my job as a pastor to challenge you. And I want to ask you a question that's going to challenge you. If you were to leave and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? How you answer that question is going to say a lot about your relationship with God. Don't pat it. Don't try to make it better than it is. Why? Because nobody's going to know except you and God. I'm not asking you to answer it out loud. I'm asking you to think about it for a moment. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you hope, because you want, or because you desire to go to heaven, you're going to get there? Like you've got the most positive outlook on life? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you you were a Christian, because you were baptized as a baby, or you went to Sunday school classes, are you going to get to heaven? Nowhere in the Bible are you going to find that because you attend church here, you've got a gold star attendance record. Because you serve in the choir, or you work in the children's ministry, or volunteer, you won't find it anywhere in the Bible that means that you're going to get to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Muslim or any other type of world or religion, that means that by classification or default that you're a Christian and you're going to go to heaven. You can't find that in the Bible, yet we think, well, I, I'm American, I guess I'll go to heaven. Nowhere does it say that you can give yourself a label. We like to do that. You know, I, I'm, I'm a label, I'm this or I'm that, I'm a Christian. Nowhere does it say that because you've labeled yourself a Christian. You wear a cross around your neck, or maybe you've got a tattoo or a, a scriptural reference or a religious symbol somewhere on your body mean that you're going to get to heaven. You can't get to heaven that way. You won't find it in the Bible. Somebody once told me, man, i got to live the good life because I don't want to go to hell. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you live a good life, because you give to the Red Cross, and because you help your fellow human, because you try to do more good in your life than you do bad, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that that's going to get you into heaven? Yet we think that because we're good people, we think that because we go to church, we think that because our parents called us Christians that we're going to get to heaven. But listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough, and I honor you enough today to tell you the truth. You're not going to get to heaven based on those things. There's nothing you and I could ever do on our own that would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because it's God's heaven. The only way to get there is God's way. And His standard is perfection. The problem is we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, like the Bible tells us. All of us have fallen short. We can't make it on our own. So how do we get to God's heaven? Well, the only way is God's way. Jesus Christ is that way. Jesus says He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except through Him. In the book of John, in the third chapter, Jesus is speaking with a religious man. And in the conversation of eternal life, Jesus says, You must be born again. What does that mean? Not what Hollywood and society and sitcoms have made it out to be. Born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing. 
It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, Jesus Himself is speaking to His church and He says, listen, I'm coming back. And He says, when I come back, I'd rather find you the church hot or I'd rather find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, Jesus says, I will vomit you from my mouth. A shocking statement from the mouth of Jesus. And what He's saying is that lukewarm Christians are, not going, to be, are going to be rejected and ejected out of the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm? Let's define that. Let's discuss that. Lukewarm simply means that you've got your ups and your downs and your ins and your outs. You're a little bit for God. You're, you're, not, you're kind of you're doing your own thing. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're not running to Him. You're not running from Him. You're kind of riding the fence. Three hot meals a day and one cold snack a week. Jesus says, if that's you, you're not going to make it. Listen, I love you enough. I respect you enough to tell you the truth. If you're riding the fence in this place today, you're not going to make it. I know that might challenge you. I know that might rub you the wrong way. But listen, let me do my job as a pastor and tell you the truth. We can't get to heaven our way. Can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way we can do it is God's way, and that's Jesus. Jesus said these words, if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his Father. He says, if you deny him, he will deny you before his Father. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to make the choice. You see, God respected you so much that he gave you a free will choice to choose, to hear it, to accept it as truth, or to reject it, and to accept his gift or to reject it. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. We don't work for it. We can't buy it. We can't earn it. It's grace through faith. But it starts by making the decision to accept Jesus Christ. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. It's your choice to choose, to hear, and to accept or to reject. Jesus said, if you confess him, he'll confess you. So today I want to do this. I'm going to count to three. I'll go one, two, and on the count to three, I'll go three. And I'll smack my hands real loud, just like that. And I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. You say, man, if that's me you're talking about. What you're doing by the raising of your hand, we'll do it all together in just a moment. What you're doing is you're saying, I, I want to give my heart, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I'm a man, I'll see it. And you can put it right back down after that. Who should raise their hands? If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus in just a moment, if that's you, get ready. Who should raise your hands? If you're not sure, maybe you did this in a youth group or at a harvest crusade. You prayed that prayer once before, but you never really followed through with it. If that's you, just get ready in a moment. Who should pray this prayer? If you've been living lukewarm, listen, if you've been playing around, been playing church, you know what I'm talking about. Doing the church thing on Sunday, the rest of the, the, rest of the week you're doing your thing. Listen, if that's you, I love you enough, I respect you enough to take it serious. God's not in heaven with a two by four waiting to whack you over the head. He's not like a little kid on an anthill with a magnifying glass burning you up so you'd make the decision. God respects you and he wants you to make the decision. But it starts by doing that. Today, if that's you, whether you think or, uh, or, or have experienced heaven or hell, doesn't matter. It's real. When you die, you'll go to one of two places, heaven or hell. God's not in the business of condemning men to hell. He's in the business of redeeming you to heaven. And he's given Jesus Christ to die on a cross for our sin and our shame for that price. And it starts by accepting Jesus today. Wherever you're at, from the front row, the back row, listen, if you're in the foyer, in the family rooms, I can see you guys through the window. If you're at home watching online or in the, in the cafe eating a burrito or whatever it is, listen, it doesn't matter where you're at. This is your moment. This is your time. I don't care if you've been in this church for 26 years or one hour. It does not matter. What matters is the condition of your soul. Don't leave today without making sure that you're in the right place with God. It's not just about where you go when you die. Jesus said he's come to give you life and life. Uh, abundant. Maybe you find yourself in the position of an abandoned belief. Get back on track and start right with God. You don't need any more problems in your life. Jesus is the answer to them. And it starts by making the decision. I'm going to count wherever you're at. Front row, back row, family rooms, online, wherever you're at. If you're ready, if this is your moment, this is your time, get ready to pop your hand up when I count. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and you can put it right back down. You ready? Here we go. One, two, Three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see you. One, two, three. I see that hand right over there. Three wise people. Any, where are you guys at today? Let me see your hands today. I see the ushers pointing over here. Where are you at over here? I see the ushers pointing. All right, five, six. I got you guys down there. Got to kind of keeping it low. Where are you at? Seven. All right, over here. Anybody else? Eight. I got you right over here. All right, my man. Eight wise people. Anybody else? You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. Come on, quit playing games with God. Stop messing around. Nine. I got you. Nine wise people. Anybody else? You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. This is your moment. This is your time. Ten, I see you right here up in the front. I got you. Anybody else? You say, man, this is it. 
Should I do this? You should. Ten wise people. I didn't embarrass them. Not going to embarrass you. This is your moment. This is your time. Eleven, I got you back there. Anybody else? Well, praise God for eleven wise people. Here's what we're going to do. If you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, you say, I want to. That's, that's the start. You're making that decision. Now it's time to follow through, to do something with the decision, your belief, to, to, to do something with it. Follow up with follow through. So if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, in a moment we're all going to stand. As we do, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, or anything. If you came with somebody, say, go with me. Or look to that person and say, hey, I'll go with you. And get out of your seat, get, in your, get into the aisle, and come meet me up here. We're going to change destinies together, you and me, right here, right now. So let's all stand together. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on, come meet me right here. We're going to change destinies right here, right now. I surrender. And I surrender. Wherever you're at, if that's you, come on. And I want to know you more. I want to know. I surrender. Yes, I want to know you more. If that's you, you raise your hand or you know you should have. Come on. That's you, we'll wait. You can come. Come on. If you raise your hand, come on. Follow through. We're still coming. We'll wait for you. This is your moment. And I want to know you more. I want to know you more. Awesome. Hey, you guys came. I want to tell you something. Today's a good day. You're not going to a funeral, okay? You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. You want to know something? You're really smart. That's good news. Sometimes you just need somebody to tell you you're smart. You're making the best decision you can make as a human being. That's really cool. Good job. I want to do something. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really neat guy. He's going to take you guys just right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Look, I'm the guy that's got lettuce on the stage, okay? You, you made it through me. He's going to take you guys right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus to be the Lord and Savior. What does that mean? Leader of your life. He's going to give you some free information, real easy to read, to help point you in the right direction. What do I do now? We're going to point you in that right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back. We want to hang out with you. We want to get to know you. We want to connect you with a friend here in church. Somebody that will meet with you right here at church to buy you a cup of coffee or sit down with you and get you a soda or something like that. Teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from. So if you just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent Him for me, and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. 
Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.